All right. Um, the long title of this talk was From Data to AI Using the Machine Learning Canvas. Uh, the machine learning can so initially I mean you know I'm, I'm the organizer of, the, of this conference but I don't want to use it as a platform to speak uh, but I think that Ruben suggested that it would be interesting to have me uh, present this I'm gonna make it shorter than initially uh, than we thought initially because we we're running a little bit late uh, but all right so I published this article a few months ago uh, so the presentation is based on that and among the people who liked the presentation, I noticed that there were a lot of people from Brazil for some reason. So I was like, okay, that makes sense. Uh, I'll make a presentation. But yeah, I'll try to make it short. This is the machine learning canvas that I'm going to be presenting. But, you know, first things first. All right, and uh, this is the uh, university where I uh, teach um, machine learning. And we also use uh, the, the machine learning canvas as part of the course. Um, the thing is, so it's University College London, and the campus is the one of, whoops, sorry, I got that wrong. Uh, the campus is the one that we have here in this tower, uh, which is the Canary Wharf Tower in London, if you've ever been there. It's also where we had the previous uh, Papis Europe conference. And it's a school of management, so there's different uh, campuses uh, across the city, but this one is the school of management. So people are interested in um, how to make the connection from machine learning, which is technical to you know, business cases. So that's why, that's why we, we want to use this. And I always to use the same tool for uh, whenever I'm uh, consulting with companies. So the other activity that I have apart from organizing conferences and teaching machine learning is uh, being a consultant, independent consultant, helping people get started with machine learning. Uh, all right, and I want to say a, little, a couple of things about what I mean by AI. Uh, AI can mean a ton of things. But uh, it can mean this, uh, um, autonomous vehicles. I'm not going to speak about that. Uh, and this is, uh, this is an example from France. We've got these things running in the street. So no, actually, it's in a park. So it's fairly limited. But you know, it's deployed in the real world. It's cool. I'm not going to speak about that kind of AI. I'm not going to speak about AI that generates music or you know, any of the fancy artistic stuff. Um, I'm not going to speak about anything uh, regarding vision. Or maybe you, know, you could ex you could extend what I'll be speaking about to um, examples in the computer vision domain or computer graphics domain, but you know the GAN stuff, which is pretty cool, which is getting you know lots of uh, media attention. Not the kind of AI that I'm going to be speaking about. I'm going to be speaking about that. <laughs> so <laughs> much more boring, right? Um, and well, now we are at a stage where people seem to understand that it's important to have data. And then you know they have data, they open it in Excel, and then they're like, "All right, how do I get value from that?" That's the big question. And apparently, you know, the one of the answers is use machine learning and deep learning, and then you'll get value from your data. I'm going to try to speak a little bit about that. Uh, there's a lot of anticipation around machine learning and deep learning, uh, a lot of hype, as I said earlier, and that's uh, so the the hype cycle from Gartner, which sort of says that machine learning and deep learning being at the top, the the the, the hype is peaking right now. And if you look at machine learning, it's a little bit further uh, ahead in the curve. So what's come next is disillusionment and then enlightenment and productivity. Right, yeah, that's a zoomed version. All right. And yeah, AI is also um, a big buzzword. So this is, uh, this is from an ad that, sorry, that we have in France uh, for perfume, right? So it used to be, you know, actors and musicians and so on. And now, you know, artificial intelligence researcher. Crazy, you know? <laughs> so apparently you guys didn't know that before. So it's not in Brazil, but yeah, it was, it was on TV. It was everywhere. Uh, but yeah, it seems that, you know, people are realizing that things are changing and the, the level of hype is going down a little bit. So there was this piece on Venture Beat about the fact that, you know, deep learning might not uh, solve all the problems of the world apparently and um, but anyways I think that there's some really cool use cases of machine learning and deep learning uh, in apps to make them more useful to add you know smart features so this is taken from uh, the presentation that last year we had from uber uh, on uber eats and they predict you know how long it's going to be to get your uh, meal so that's a regression problem right predict uh, a quantity and then machine learning is also used to you know to have a new take on 
um, problems that are fairly well known, like um, credit scoring. So, you know, people have uh, been applying to uh, applying for credit for a very long time, and uh, the banks need to evaluate the risk associated to the credit applica application. But um, the same idea can be used in other contexts. So, on Kiva, for instance, which is this platform that allows to fund projects in developing countries, uh, to also, you know, predict if uh, the amount of risk um, related to th those loan applications and um, yeah, so very useful. Um, there is this example that I like very much and I'm gonna use it in the rest of this presentation which is real estate. It's uh, fairly simple, you know, you've, you've got a real estate property on the market and um, the seller uh, gives an asking price and uh, but maybe that's not the real value of the house. What would be interesting to know would be, you know, based on all the data and all the, the previous real estate transactions that have been seen, what is the right price? What is the right value for this property? Which is what this website does, so Zillow in the US. And they've got this thing called the, the Zestimate. Uh, fade that again. Right, it's here, yeah. Zestimate, it tells you in this case, it's pretty similar to the asking price. Right. And the problem uh, associated to that is a regression one. Uh, you try to predict the price. So imagine that all right, in this data, each row is a real estate property. Each column is an aspect of this property. What you try to predict is the price column. Um, so that's what machine learning does. It fills in these missing values. And this is the, the general idea, you know, training model and then predicting with a model. How do you do that? Well, you know, it's a big topic. Uh, there's challenges around that, Kaggle challenges. But now there's products that automate this. And actually the people at, uh, so DataRobot for instance is one of these products. Uh, they've hired tons of, uh, a few Kaggle experts to implement this, you know, automating this process. So you don't really have to worry about that too much anymore. Uh, that at least that's the promise. Uh, Big ML is another example. They do this uh, automatic optimization thing. So, you know, automating the creation of machine learning models. Um, and I tried it out on the Kaggle challenge. It wasn't that great, but still, you know, fairly good. Like out of 625 human competitors, data scientists, you know, the rank was approximately uh, 300 and something. So, you know, about in the middle. So fairly interesting. And there's the same thing in the open source world based on uh, research. And this is an active research topic, you know, automatically creating the right models given a data set. Uh, but it's not just, you know, fancy machine learning products and then uh, research projects. There's also, um, you know, major companies that uh, want to do automated machine learning or that do machine learning, automated machine learning in production. I'm taking two examples because we've got a speaker from Airbnb, that's one. And the other one is Salesforce. And we had a talk from someone at Salesforce um, a couple of years ago, I think, and what uh, that person was saying is that they have more models to deploy than they are data scientists in the world. And in those cases, the only solution is to automate part of the job of the data scientist. All right, I like this comparison of, you know, thinking of machine learning as a car. And I think that I had a, I had a similar slide last year, but yeah, the researcher would be the person who tweaks the engine the Kagler would be the person that, you know, puts different pieces together and you know, <laughs> pimp my model. Um, and then that should be you, I think. <laughs> so, you know, just, you, you shouldn't be worrying about, you know, attaching a steering wheel to your, uh, to your engine and attaching uh, wheels and uh, creating the, the gearbox and so on. Um, you should just, you know, use the machine learning product to the car to complete your mission. That's what you should be worrying about. So, and that goes back to what someone else was saying, um, which is that uh, predictive modeling is important, but you know, it disappears uh, into the plumbing. And that person was Jeremy Howard, fairly known in the machine learning community. Um, I think I also had this slide last year, uh, but what, I've just changed it. So it says, you know, um, your machine learning system, you, you have a pile of linear algebra, and uh, I just replace that with you know, autom automated machine learning stuff. And what if the answers are wrong? Well, you know, it's important to know how to evaluate that, how to quantify that. So maybe predictive modeling is disappearing in the plumbing, 
but model evaluation is not. And that's probably one of the first things you should worry about before starting any implementation. Once you've spe specified your machine learning task, classification, regression, and so on, you, know, you should be thinking about that uh, very early. And because depending on what you choose, you know, certain models, so each uh, line is a model, might be better. And each column is a way to evaluate the performance of the model. So green means good. So depending on what's the right way to evaluate the performance, you would choose completely different models, right? So it's very important to think about that as soon as possible. Uh, otherwise, you can't really optimize things. And uh, again, going back to the Uber example that was presented last year, there was this, um, this uh, view of the interface. So for them, it's also important to show these views, uh, these graphical views of the performance metrics, not just to engineers, but also to uh, decision makers. Right? So yeah, decision makers need to worry about that. Um, they are, um, going back to Kaggle, uh, so there's something that they do in addition to the, the machine learning competitions, is these surveys every year. And there was one on what are the barriers to using machine learning in production in your own applications. And so they identified, so they did this survey and had tons of people re uh, reply to the question. Uh, a lot of people are saying that all right, we, we are not really getting value from machine learning because there's a lack of a clear question to answer. Uh, results are not used by decision makers, so it's important to involve decision makers as early as possible in your experimentations of, um, with machine learning. And you see that the machine learning canvas is a good tool for that, to have everyone on the same page. Uh, lack of domain expert input. You also want to have um, your engineers and scientists communicate with domain experts as early as possible. Another thing that the, the machine learning canvas will help with. And then integrating findings into decisions. And that's probably one of the uh, first questions that the machine learning canvas asks you to uh, answer. What do you want to do with the predictions coming out of the machine learning model? And I like to tell people, all right, you specified your machine learning problem. The first thing that we naturally want to do is to do a proof of concept or to, make, to see if it works. Is it feasible? Uh, do we get good results and so on? Uh, but before doing that, I like to ask people, all right, imagine that you would get perfect predictions. How do you use them? How do you make something useful? Uh, sometimes it can be straightforward. Other times it can be very difficult. And even if you have perfect predictions, there are cases where the system is still useless. So it's very important to you know, ask yourself those questions as early as possible. And um, I think that this rings very true in the domain of machine learning. So uh, we saw that you know, one of the barriers is the formulation of the problem. I think that the full quote from Einstein was, um, the formulation of the problem is more often is sorry is often more essential than its solution, which may be merely a matter of mathematical or experimental. Sorry, I don't get the. Well, it may be you know, it, it involves math and uh, experimentation, um, but yeah, formalizing the problem is the most important thing. Right. Sorry, I couldn't get the right quote, but anyways, machine learning canvas. Um, the idea of the canvas, and you might have heard of um, other types of canvases, like the business model canvas or whatever. This is not really connected. I mean, there might be some similarities, but the idea of a canvas is just to represent things in space in a way that makes sense, so that instead of having a long document, um, you know, a long word file, uh, you would have, you know, a visual chart that may, that would make it easier to navigate um, in, you know, a certain amount of information about you know, machine learning systems. So the idea is to describe machine learning systems or AI systems, and specifically, we don't want to describe everything about them. We want to describe the learning bits. So we want to speak about the data that is used to learn from. We want to speak about how predictions are used, and in the end, you know, how how can we make sure? How do we know if the whole thing works or not? This is what the machine learning canvas focuses on. This is what it allows you to, uh, to think about. Um, there's quite a few, so this is the right, visual chart. Things that are next to each other should be related. Uh, like you see that data sources is right next to collecting data. All right, the data stuff, stuff is over there. And there is a structure to this document, which is the following one. So starting at the very center with the goal, what you're trying to do, 
uh, why you want to do it and who do you want to do it for. And I think that it's very important to uh, also think about the who, because there's always someone, there's always a user of your system. There's always an end user. And many times, discussions that you have about machine learning applications don't really go forward because it's not clear who the user is, you know, who the value proposition is for. So, you know, identify that first. Um, and then maybe you can start thinking about, all right, how do I translate this value proposition into a machine learning problem? Probably be best to, um, to limit yourself to classification and regression at first. There's already tons of things to be done in classification and regression. Uh, so which one do you want to do? And how do you translate this value proposition into uh, a machine learning question, uh, which you know, is a classification or regression problem, like in the case of real estate, it would be how much, uh, how much is this property worth? And then you'd, you'd expect a number as the answer. So maybe it's fairly easy in the real estate example, but there could be other examples where you know, this is very difficult to translate it into uh, a machine learning task, to translate the value proposition into a machine learning task. So anyways, this bit is about you know, predictions, right? You have this goal, how do you reach this goal? Well, with predictions and also with learning from data. And finally, you would, uh, you would also say something about how well you are uh, completing your objective, you're reaching your goal. So this is the evaluation part, the live evaluation. All right, uh, I'm going to describe each of these boxes, but starting with those ones. Uh, this is more like the sort of background information. Things to start with would be at the top, and then uh, as soon as you've done the, the top bit, I think you should do the evaluation. Think about um, how you can measure whether or not you are providing the, the value that you proposed. And then afterwards, you can go into the specifics, which are grayed out here. So let's start with value proposition. And again, we're in this real estate example. Um, so one idea, I mean, what could we do with these predictions? One idea I had, uh, and I think that's sort of similar to what Paul Peterson presented last year uh, at Pepe's in Sao Paulo. Uh, you could use those predictions to make better real estate investments. And how would you do that? You'd compare the price predictions with the asking price. So if you're predicting that the value is higher than what the asking price is, might be a good deal, right? Because maybe the, the, the property is uh, under undervaluated. Um, and yeah, that way you find the best deals. All right, let's keep it at like that for now. Data sources, you'd need to collect data. Maybe you would want to scrape data from, I don't know, Zillow, or uh, the example that Paul had was Redfin, I think, uh, which makes it, I think they have a feature to export data uh, in a very convenient way. And then maybe you also want to use you know, open data, like data about public transports or schools. Some of it is open data. So you know, that's an external data source. You'd probably want to you know, make it even more specific, maybe not right now, but uh, as you revisit the canvas, make it more specific. Say, you know, what is the, how do you get that data? Is it an Excel file or is it from an API? Uh, so you know, making that a little bit more explicit. And maybe you also want to, right, so Redfin would give you an address of the property, but you wouldn't know where it is on a map. So maybe Google Maps allows you to do that. You could list it as a potential data source. Right, so just identifying that and maybe some of the constraints related to accessing those data sources. And then, all right, so this is just data sources, but you need to have a data collection process, right? And most often we think about connecting, collecting sorry, an initial data set but you should be thinking about the long term, like always keep collecting data because things change and you want to capture the changes in the environment. So maybe what you would do is that every week you would collect you know, new data for the new properties on the market, right? There's new properties on the market all the time. So you'd get the, the characteristics. You wouldn't know the, the price of the transaction, the, the property has just arrived on the market, but you would know the asking price. And you would also look at all the say records from the last week, where you know, you'd see properties that you've already seen before, but this time you would, um, you would get the say price because you know, these are say records. Um, right, so that's what we do every week, and maybe you know, initially when you create your first data sets, you would use you know, the past year's data. Maybe it's just, 
maybe you want to do two years worth of data, maybe three years, but probably 10 years is a better idea because you get data which is too old. So that would be informed by domain knowledge. So it's useful to, you know, when you're doing this, to get the uh, domain people involved because they will tell you what makes sense and what doesn't, right? So in that case, you know, past year should be good. Um, all right, so going to the left of the canvas, what is the machine learning task? So we could say, all right, regression task, how much is this property worth expecting a number? So the input is a real estate property. I'm not saying anything about how to represent this property, right? You may be thinking about looking at the number of bedrooms or the surface or these things. Let's not have this discussion too early. Let's just identify what is the object behind that, right? What is the input object? Uh, so we want to predict the value of this thing. It's a regression task. But you could also think of things in a different way. Like you would still get... Uh, so another way to do this is to say, all right, I still have a, a property as input, but my question is, you know, is this a good deal? Right? You have a property, you have the asking price, and you need to say, yes, it's a good deal, or no, it's not a good deal. And this is very valid. Um, I haven't seen anyone do that, but you know, on paper, it's valid. So it's a possibility. And there's quite a few cases where uh, you could do either regression or classification. Uh, so one at least real example is predictive maintenance. You could either predict how many days until your equipment phase, or you could uh, predict whether there's going to be a failure within X days, which is you know, classification. So yeah, there's, there could be different answers uh, to these um, to these questions in these boxes. Okay, so um, we've identified uh, a machine learning problem, but then we still need to make the connection back to the uh, value proposition. So how do you use predictions in order to make decisions to do things that change the world, right? Uh, what, what you would do is that every week you would compute predictions for the new properties that have just come, on, come up on the market. And uh, what you can do then is filter out all the bad deals, which are those where the asking price is higher than what you predicted the value was. And then uh, quite simply, you could just you know, give that to uh, the real estate investor who's in charge of making, so visiting the properties and deciding what to invest in. So it goes back to what Fabio was saying um, regarding you know, augmenting people. And uh, probably what they do is that, you know, if they, so they visit the property uh, for real, they've prioritized which properties to, to visit first. And um, once they visit, they make sure that, you know, everything looks okay. And if everything looks okay, they can invest, they can buy the property at the asking price, or maybe they can negotiate. But yeah, that would be the, the assumption. How do we make sure that this thing works? This whole idea uh, will um, work well. Well, first thing first, you know, if you want to improve uh, investment decisions, your investment return should go up. Um, you would also think that by prioritizing the list of um, properties to, to visit, you would decrease the time spent visiting properties because, you know, you're not going to spend, you're not going to waste time visiting properties that are not uh, good deals, right? And uh, you could also just look at the accuracy of your predictions, right? So maybe what you do is that instead of, um, instead of considering all of the properties on the market as you know, potential properties where you could invest, you're going to select randomly half of them and not do anything about them. That's what you call the, the holdout set. And then on those properties that you, know, you, you didn't act on, you can compare when they finally get sold, you can compare the, the selling price to your prediction and see if your model was good or not. Uh, right, so again, um, I'm gonna make this presentation a little bit shorter than intended. Uh, so I'm not gonna speak about, I'm not gonna speak much about the other boxes, but uh, here you've got, I'll just say a few things. You've got um, a few things about making predictions, when you wanna make them, and how much time you have to make predictions, any time constraints, any technical constraints on the, the predictive engine that makes predictions, and also on the engine that builds models, right? How much time do you have to, uh, to update your model, and how often do you wanna update your model, uh, those things.
features. So how do you represent your input? So that's also in the uh, in the learn bit. So you know, characterizing the data that we learn from. And then you know, maybe before you do you you deploy something uh, for real and evaluate it and uh, monitor it live, maybe you want to do an offline evaluation where you would sort of simulate what would happen if you would have implemented this. So using the data that you already have, you know, make a simulation and see if it works well or not. So you would explain the simulation in that part of the canvas. Uh, so as you can see, we're starting from sort of background information and going down to more specifics, right? Uh, okay, I'm gonna skip that. And right, if you're wondering what my ideas would be for what to put in these boxes for the real estate example. Uh, you can find that online. I've uh, shared an example. I've shared a few examples, a few machine learning canvas examples. So there's the real estate one. Um, right, and another way to look at this canvas. So I said that it's a good tool to get everyone on the same page and to get everyone to think about the same uh, machine learning ideas. So this is sort of how I think um, people would, um, d depending on your role, there might be, uh, there might be boxes where you should be uh, more involved. So the data scientist would be more involved in um, you know, the specifying the machine learning task and the features and you know, how often to build models. Uh, and maybe the software engineer should also be involved in determining the technical constraints for building models and also for making predictions. Right? Um, so yeah, the idea is to have everyone um, work together on uh, making these canvases. So that's what I do in uh, workshops uh, around the machine learning canvas. And another key ingredient is this for creativity. You know, have some drinks. <laughs> uh, but it's good to be creative, right? In this process, right? You know, there's nothing wrong. You just have to iterate and be creative and uh, share your ideas and discuss with your team members using this tool. Um, so my recommendation just to wrap up, uh, would be to frame your machine learning problem before implementing anything or before hiring anyone. And then, you know, once you have a better idea of what you want to do, uh, you can you know, think about implementation. Um, I'd like to also leave you with a quote from uh, an interesting article on um, um, also, you know, using machine learning in real world projects, uh, where essentially the author was saying that, you know, product people should be focusing on solving problems, solving re real problems, but um, I don't know, for some reason, when we think about machine learning, so we forget about the engineering aspects, but we also forget about um, solving real problems that uh, people have. So, you know, think about that. You're thinking about your end user of your predictive system. Think about what are their pains and what are their problems before you do any implementation. And sorry, the author is Chris Butler. Um, that's it. Uh, you can... Um, find more information about me or you can get in touch with me at louis.ai and uh, also there's more there's links to more resources about the machine learning canvas and other things if you want to you know learn things about machine learning but also there's machinelearningcanvas.com which currently redirects to uh, the other website but it's going to be separate at some point and um, all right that's it thank you for thank you <laughs>
so that it doesn't look like a black box. So also look at these things, the visualizations of models and their performance to um, you know, get a better idea of you know, what, what would be right in your specific case. Okay, thanks. All right, just one more question and then, yeah, we can, we can speak more in the coffee break. Um, is it, is it uh, considerable to build this kind of project and use the uh, ML Canvas to redirect project that deals with feature engineering specifically, not the modeling? Because some, I've seen some features that they were so complex to generate, they were actually uh, models that would generate features to feed other models. So, should the should right. the canvas uh, wrap the whole thing, the, so, the final so model? What, what you or could do is you could chain canvases uh, where the output of one machine learning problem would be um, would be fed to another machine learning problem. Uh, so you would have a canvas for each machine learning problem, and you could you know sort of chain things, um, but. The other thing that I want to say about feature engineering is that yes, you know, this is um, something that this is a discussion that needs to involve uh, everyone, uh, domain experts, but also uh, also engineers, maybe data scientists, to make sure that you know the ideas are sane, but also engineers because you have uh, constraints in terms of. So I was I was saying things about the time that you have to update your models or to make predictions. That also includes the time to generate features. So you know your ideas in terms of features, um, they must be feasible. So given the constraints that are listed in the other boxes of the canvas, so I, I would definitely recommend. Even if you know the, the main concern is feature engineering, I would recommend to fill in the whole of the canvas because uh, also one thing that we observe in machine learning projects is that uh, changing anything changes everything. So everything is connected. Um, so you know it's good to make the efforts of uh, specifying the whole problem and uh, you know, not just the, the feature engineering bits. All right, so again, uh, let's speak more in the, uh, in the coffee break. And yeah, thank you again. <laughs>